Alrighty, well, just got back to the farm here with this little gem on the trailer. Unload it and see if we can't get it going. Hey everybody, welcome back to Diesel Creek. My name is Matt. We're in the shop today and we're gonna be working on something that's been hogging up room in here for several months and I wanna get it out of my road. That being this giant green thing sitting over here. I guess it's not giant, but it's pretty large. Uh, probably only looks slightly smaller because it's in here instead of your little two car garage. But what this is, or I guess I should say what this was, was a gen set, an army gen set. And I believe this one specifically was set up for providing power to planes. Uh, something about the frequency, I'm not an electrician, but something about the frequency of aircraft is different than like the same frequency, like 60 hertz is what runs um, all your AC power in a shop like this or your home or whatever. This thing was set up differently. So the fella I bought this unit off of removed that generator head that put out that weird frequency and was going to install the correct 60 hertz frequency generator head um, to use as a home backup but ended up going a different route. The reason I picked this thing up is because of this bad boy right here. If you guys can see that tag, that says Alice Chalmers on it. And this is a 3500A model, six cylinder Alice Chalmers diesel engine. So that engine in that unit right there is the exact same engine that's in this unit right here being Fat Alice. If you're not familiar with Fat Alice, uh, this is my big, well, medium-sized wheel loader that I picked up a few years ago. I saved this thing where it had lived its life working in a scrapyard and was pretty much just left there and abandoned after the scrapyard shut down. So I went in there, me and my buddy Mike, and got this thing fired up after sitting for many, many years. And it's been a trusty workhorse ever since. but it has never really run very well at all. The engine slobbers oil from every orifice. It has a very stumbly and rough idle and doesn't make a whole lot of power. So I was planning on pulling basically the entire fuel system off of this engine. This has a, I can't remember if it's a Stanadyne or a Rusa Master. I think it's a Rusa Master uh, fuel injection pump there and I know better than to touch one of those because the last time I tried, I broke it and ended up having to send it out to area diesel service. But anyways, I was gonna pull that pump off and all the injectors and just send them down to area diesel service and have them completely rebuild all that stuff and you know see where we were at with this engine after that. I think it would run considerably better if I did do that. But then again, I also think that it is probably a little low on compression because it just flat out refuses to start uh, without a little whiff of ether until it's warmed up. After it's hot, it'll restart all day long. But without that first little initial bump of ether, it's not going to happen. So I was pretty well committed to doing all that work to Fat Alice. I thought, you know, this loader is very handy. I use it all the time. Why not give it a little bit of love? And we'll put a bunch of time and effort and money into fixing this engine up to what it should be. But then I found this guy. And I don't remember what they had it listed for, but long story short, I saw what kind of engine this was. And again, it's the same engine that's in Fat Alice. And everything I've ever seen from the government, that when it gets auctioned off, it's either completely destroyed or it's like brand new. And this unit right here seems to fall into the latter category. There doesn't seem to be any leaks or anything. It's a very clean looking unit. The problem is that I have not heard this unit run. The guy that I bought it from told me there was something wrong with the starter. Um, so that's pretty much all I know. We threw it on the truck and I ended up giving him $500 for this unit. I did stick a bar on the engine and I could get it to move a little bit, although I don't even think I've made it a full revolution. I don't think I've tried to make it a full revolution. So I'm hopeful that there's nothing wrong internally. I'm gonna just about guarantee that this engine is super low hours 
I don't remember something with the oil drain too. It might be out of oil. It's been sitting here for several months. Yes, there's zero oil on the dipstick and the engine is actually leaning this way. So that's slightly concerning. So the only things that concern me about this unit, there's two things that I can visually see uh, right off the bat that are concerning. One is the cooling package up here. This is your radiator, of course. But then this is the lower section of the radiator and you've got like this, I don't know what this stuff is. It's like a jelly, it's wet, but it's hardened. It's like crystallized. I've never seen anything like that. I don't know if the military runs some sort of special coolant that turns into that, but we got like stalagmites or stalactites. I, I never remember which one goes up or down, but we've got some goofiness going on there. So I'm wondering if the cooling system is gunked up really bad. So that's a concern. I don't know if you guys can see in there, but it doesn't look bad. So that's a good sign. I'm, I'm feeling pretty hopeful of that. The other issue is because the generator head is removed, it has no rear engine mount. So basically you have a front and a rear mount and the rear mount was kind of connected to the gen head, which was then connected to this framework. When I bought it, the fella had this chain bolted to the flywheel housing there. And then he had uh, this 35 cent Home Depot turnbuckle holding it up. Well, I didn't really pay too much attention to any of that when I bought it. So we loaded it on the truck, I chained it down and I hit the road and Pennsylvania, actually I bought this in Ohio, Ohio and Pennsylvania roads together they're just primo, let me tell you. There, there wasn't one single pothole in the first three feet of that trip. So, we, we <laughs> there was plenty of bumps on the way home. And as you can see, the turnbuckle suffered a bit. That straightened out and let the engine kind of fall down, basically. And when it did that, the fan here contacted the radiator shroud and bent the fan a bit. I'm hopeful that we can straighten that, but that's kind of an iffy thing to straighten. If you don't get it quite balanced right, there's a chance that it can, uh, you know, turn into a projectile, which would be a bad time. I threw this turnbuckle on the back here just to get the engine up off the fuel tank because this has a built-in fuel cell down here. I think it's like a 50 or 60 gallon fuel tank built into this skid. so. I think I did okay for 500 bucks. I'm, I'm confident that we can get this engine to run, but I don't know yet. So the whole point of today's video is just to see what we actually have here. And if it's a good running engine, well, we know we have a good running spare engine for Fat Alice and I would like to swap it out here eventually. So let's start with the obvious things. Like I said, we're gonna have to figure out some way to suspend the rear of the engine here and uh, try to straighten out that radiator fan. Let's try a come along here first. I think this ought to do. Oh yeah. Yep, things are happening. Great success, I think we got it. As you can see, the engine is sitting a lot more squarely in the frame now. We've got support on three sides of the engine, so that should be plenty. As you can see right here, we've got clearance clearance. Roger, Roger, what's our vector, Victor? But we still have a bent fan blade to contend with. We'll try to rotate that down here and maybe get some pliers on it. As you can imagine, going hard out here all day, every day, I can work up quite an appetite. And we all gotta eat. The good news is that recently, I found a great new way to get in a good meal, super quick and super easy, thanks to Factor Meals. Now, I'd seen Factor's commercials before with their claims of fresh, never frozen meals delivered right to your door, but I was skeptical. All that's changed now because it was love at first bite, and I truly mean that. Factor Meals have become my go-to lunch option because they taste so great and are so convenient. Just two minutes in the microwave 
and you've got a delicious meal. No need to run to the grocery store, no more chopping, no more prepping, and best of all, no cleanup. Just heat and enjoy. You can also level up your meals with Gourmet Plus options prepared to perfection by chefs ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients such as broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Head to factor75.com or click the link down below and use the code CREEK50 to get 50% off of your first box. I've never been more serious than I am right now. Factor has changed my routine and saved me a ton of time. I can't stress enough how delicious and convenient these meals truly are. Factor has made a believer out of me, and I'm not just saying that. Be sure you click the link and use the code CREEK50 to get yourself these awesome meals for a great price. That's factor75.com and use the code CREEK50. I am going to go eat one right now. I guess at this juncture, the smart thing to do would be put a bar on the engine. That's why those two bolts are in there, so I could put a bar on it. We'll stick a bar on there and make sure the engine can make a complete 360 without any issues. All right, fingers crossed here that we can get a full revolution out of this thing. It turns nice and easy. That's a good sign, I guess. Well, we're getting into some compression. We won't be needing it for our purposes. Look at that. There we go. That's a full revolution. That's great news. No weird noises, no tight spots, no nothing. So that's good. I guess we should probably put some oil in it first though, eh? All right, right on the money. All right, we got oil now. Time to move on to the only other fluid we have to concern ourselves with this time. That'd be antifreeze. While the inside of the radiator does not look fantastic, it doesn't look awful either. Hopefully you guys can see in there. It's got some of that calcium looking buildup stuff, but it's not horrible. I would say the cooling system is definitely gonna need a good flush but uh, we don't want to do that cold and we don't want to waste money on new antifreeze so I'm just going to get some jugs of water and fill this thing up. I guess this would be an appropriate time to double check and make sure there's no coolant lines off anywhere, huh? Well, I didn't see any leaks so we're going to continue. Oh, look at that. Perfect. We're about halfway up in the reservoir portion of the radiator here, so just put the cap back on there and we're going to start playing around with that starter. All right, so we've got an engine that turns over, it's got oil, it's got coolant. We just need to be able to spin this thing over fast and we need to be able to give it fuel. Hopefully we have compression. It did turn over awful easy, but this may have some sort of compression release. Integrated, I doubt it, but I'm not super familiar with these, so I don't know. The problem we're running into right now, though, when we start exploring for this starter, is you see this giant harness of all the same color wires? Well, because this thing was a generator, it had all sorts of fail-safe conditions and safety switches and sensors and there's like voltage regulator. This, this says speed control unit on it. Yeah, engine speed control component. So we've got some governing apparatuses going on here. Down here on the side of the engine where our fuel injection pump is back here, this is not a Rusa Massa like on the other one. This is a I guess that's Stanodyne, but it's a weird logo for Stanodyne. I don't think I've ever seen that logo before. But anyway, we've got an electronic servo controlled throttle arm over here, so that would increase or decrease the engine speed. To activate the injection pump, essentially, to kill the fuel to it, and there's a spring loaded shutoff solenoid in the cover on the injection pump. And 
there's some wires going up there and I also see this switch here it says dead crank switch so I think that's if you wanted to crank this thing over without it starting you would flick that to the off position if everything else was still connected and in working order we pretty much have to bypass all the wiring on this thing pretty much all we should need to start this thing is 12 volts going to the fuel shutoff solenoid and whatever voltage we need going to our starter I have to establish whether this is a 12 or 24 volt starter the one on Fat Alice is 24 so I think that's probably where we're gonna start the other issue and we might be able to scour this ID tag off and find out for sure but that fuel shutoff solenoid that's in the pump up there can either be 12 or 24 volts if my memory serves on Fat Alice it's a 12 volt solenoid but the rest of the system is 24 volts so without taking that cover off which looks like a giant pain in the butt at this time without taking that cover off we can't be sure so I'm just gonna put 12 volts to it first and see if I can hear it clicking if it doesn't sound like it's click a thing in quite right maybe we'll bump it up to 24 I know for a fact that you can put 24 volts to the 12 volt solenoid for a small amount of time before it burns up because I've done it accidentally on that international loader that I have uh, same type of pump and same solenoid I just happened to connect my jump pack to it to get it going and happen to accidentally do so on 24 volt setting so it held up for a while should be enough to at least get this thing going well after looking at the cable configuration I decided for sure that this is a 24 volt system as I suspected so here we've got two 8D commercial batteries. This ought to have enough jam to spin her over pretty darn good. This guy right here should be our ground. We've got a crossover cable in the middle. So a crossover cable goes positive to negative, and then you treat your outside posts as your negative and positive. That gives you your 24 volts. This should be our hot. I'm going to clean these terminals up a bit, clamp them on there. That'll get the comment section going. Well, I think we just performed the smoke test. Nothing's happening yet. Nothing's sparking or arcing out or making any noises. And we have contact. So I pulled a hot wire off of the battery bank here and we can test and make sure it's hot by just touching it off of any grounded surface and we know that this wire is indeed hot. That wire on top of the injection pump right there that should operate the fuel shutoff solenoid and when I touch the stud there for that terminal we get nothing we should definitely be able to hear an audible click and nothing happens so that is concerning since this entire wiring harness that's all for the gen set side of things that's no longer here I'm just gonna go ahead and cut these wires and we can splice into them because the other one that goes up there onto the pump is a ground so we should be able to isolate the ground make sure it's still grounded maybe the other side of this wire wherever it goes is not grounded and that would keep our solenoid per, per that could potentially keep our solenoid from actuating. We'll be able to just do a little snippy snip here. There we go. One side of this goes to this switch leg over here that we don't any longer need, so we can also cut that over here. Actually, I guess we probably wouldn't smart to leave that on there, and we could have used the switch to toggle the send I guess it would have been smart to actually leave that connected and splice into the switch side so that we could have used the switch as an on off basically to shut the engine down but got a little hasty there quick and dirty we're just trying to see if this thing runs that's interesting the government spent tons of your tax dollars on this thing and it has aluminum wiring in it rather than copper
That was nice of them. So I'm going to grab my multimeter here, and we are going to do a ground test and figure out which one of these goes to ground. I'm 90% sure it's the back one, but best to double check it. Basically, we're going to do a continuity test here with our multimeter. So, can you guys hear that beeping? If you hear the beeping, you know that we've got continuity. So, I'll touch one side to the ground, and we'll touch one side to this wire. Nothing. Nothing. That's interesting. Neither side appears to be grounded. That's very interesting. Interesting and not very good. What is going on here? So to get this starter to engage, or hopefully engage, I've isolated this wire right here on the starter solenoid because that is the trigger wire. So if this gets voltage, it should engage that solenoid and engage the starter, thus spinning the engine over. So this is that wire. I'm going to snip it off right there, and we should be able to just touch it to the hot side, and we'll be in business. More aluminum wire. All right, we got our wire stripped back. This is our hot lead coming in, so we have an exposed hot side terminal over here. I should be able to just touch this wire to this stud, and it should engage the starter. You guys ready? Contact. <laughs> it works. It spins the engine over. I had a feeling that uh, that was not going to be an issue, the starter that is. The guy that sold me this engine really didn't seem like he knew a whole lot about what was going on on the engine side of things. It seemed like he knew his business about the generator side. So maybe this was a little over his head. I'm not knocking the guy, but you know, we've all got our limits of our knowledge and that is that. But I know that if I touch this wire to this stud, she spins over. Contact. Sounds pretty good to me. So the engine cranks over, that is awesome news. One more step in the right direction, but now the last piece to the puzzle that I believe we should need is fuel. So the fuel tank underneath this engine, like I talked about earlier, there's a big plastic fuel tank under there, and that's great, but it seems like it's empty, and it also kind of smells a bit like water. So I don't want to trust that tank. I don't have time to clean it out or mess with it or anything like that right now. So we're just going to rig up a temporary tank Luckily enough for us, the Army thought it necessary to allow for an auxiliary fuel tank on this unit, so it should be pretty easy to connect it. These are our, this is, is the fuel connection, this should be the supply in, and then this should be the return line back to tank. So we should be able to undo these and connect up a fuel cell and be in business. We've already got the selector switch in the auxiliary position. The set tank should be that one underneath of us, and then off, of course, is off. So let me scare up a fuel tank with some diesel fuel and some hoses that'll connect to these bad boys. All right, so I've scared up a five gallon tank of diesel fuel there, and I might've got lucky here. I picked around through my fuel line stash, and I think this might thread right onto there, and if it does, that's pretty darn lucky. And no, I don't think that's right. It's too big, too big. All right, that should do us on the feed. Just gotta figure up something for a return here. Oh, it's not professional, but it's good enough for what we're doing here. That should function fine as a return line since there's no pressure on the return side. The fuel just basically gravity flows back to tank. So of course it's pretty strange that we're not getting any response out of the fuel shutoff solenoid. I don't think I've ever come across one of these units that doesn't work. Fat Alice, when we revived her, we did have to take the cover off of that and break the plunger that it operates. We had to break that loose, but the solenoid itself worked right from the get-go. While I'm poking around here though, I noticed that there's another arm on the back side of the injection pump here. 
a lot of times that is a fuel shutoff, a manual fuel shutoff. So it spring loads probably into the closed position, I would imagine. And it definitely feels like it's engaging the pump somehow when I run it back the opposite direction. So I'm going to try and put a wire on that and pin that open. And hopefully that bypasses this electrical guy anyways. And then we can try to get this thing fired up. All right. So we've got that arm, what I hope is a fuel shutoff, pinned to what direction I think would be the run position. I'm going to go ahead and uh, crack the injectors open and start cranking this thing over. Hopefully we can see some fuel coming out of our injectors. All right, I have no idea why, but for some reason these injection lines are metric. They're a 17 millimeter. That threw me for a loop. Holy crap! Anytime I'm trying to bleed injection lines like this, I always make sure they're backed off at least a full turn. And then I come along and try to lift up on the line a little bit just to unseat the injection line, make sure it'll bleed fuel the way it's needed. All right, let's give her a whirl. Contact. So not terrible. We have, looks like we got fuel on two cylinders, number six and number two. That's a start. Let me give the starter a second and we'll go ahead and hit it again. Hmm. Well, it's suspiciously like we're not getting any more fuel. It's almost like that fuel that we're getting was already in the system and probably didn't get pumped up there from our new fuel supply. All right, so in our quest to get fuel to the injection pump, I traced out the fuel system better, which is somewhat of a task on this unit. Basically, the fuel line comes up and goes into what looks like some sort of a canister here. I really don't know what this thing does. It's got wires coming out of it, other hoses. I don't know. And then it goes down to another canister thingy, my bobber. Never seen anything like that before. Comes across into your primary fuel filter unit, down into this tank of sorts. I don't know what that is. It's aluminum. It's got a fuel shutoff solenoid at the top, so we could be stopping our flow right from there. That could be our first hang up. From this tank, it comes out and down into a secondary filter and then into the injection pump. So we're gonna cut out all the other BS and steps along the way that I don't know what we're getting at here. Take this fuel line off here, connect it to our input line, and we should be off to the races, I think. So before we can take this line off, there's a chance that this got fuel you know, in this box. So there's a drain here, we're gonna drain this out, hopefully if I can turn it, if there's anything in it, if the drain isn't stopped up. Yep, mud daubers. Grr. Kinda seems like it might be empty. Last thing I need is fuel spilled all over that sticking floor. Not a drop. So, yeah, we definitely were not getting fuel to our injection pump. Oh, man. I don't know how many years it's been since this engine hasn't run, or has run, rather. But that fuel, which just came out of this fuel line, smells like it's really old. I found this sticker on the side of this thing. I don't know what any of these codes mean, but... I think that that means that the government spent 18,765 of your hard-earned dollars on this thing at some point in time. I don't know if you can discern 
the time of the auction in which they liquidated this thing, and even if you could tell when they liquidated it, you don't know when they last ran it prior to the auction, so. Anyways. All right, so here we have our bypassed fuel system now. Fuel tank, return line, the feed line going straight into the secondary fuel filter. Not ideal for long-term setup, but I know the fuel in this bucket is clean, and at least we are still getting some filtration here. We're not going straight raw fuel into the fuel pump. So let's give her another go. Once more, and then we're gonna investigate here. Contact. Well, I was hoping to avoid it, but it's leaving me no choice here, and we bypassed it all anyways, so we can go ahead and take off this fuel filter assembly and whatever the heck that box is for. Take that whole bracketed arm off, and that should give us access to the fuel pump. We'll take that whole thing off, and that should give us access to the injection pump, and we can see what the heck is going on in there. Now fuel wants to come out of this little tank. <laughs> that is not, not what diesel fuel is supposed to look like. That is not good. It doesn't even really smell like fuel anymore. Boy, I hope the inside of our injection pump does not look like that. All right, this cap should come off of the pump now. Just need to give it a little tappy tap. There we go. Oh as I try not to break the gasket holding it. Don't break, don't break. All right, well we got good news. The good news is the inside of the fuel pump does not look like the fuel that came out of that little chamber thing. Alrighty, I think I got to the root of our problems here on why we're not getting fuel. So this is the lid to the injection pump and this little doodad right here, that's your fuel shutoff solenoid. So should, theoretically, when you give it voltage, this arm should suck back like that. Now, I did look at the end of the solenoid here. It's upside down, but you can see it says 24 volts on there, so we know which one it is. Um, but I was looking, both the studs on top of this unit are identical, whereas all the ones I've worked on in the past one stud is insulated and goes down through and you know attaches to your solenoid and that's your hot side and then the other side is a ground and it just has a hard metal tab that goes from the stud to the case over here and then you put a bolt down through it and it grounds out the other side in this case they had a separate ground through the wiring harness i don't know why you'd want that that seems like an overly complicated thing so i figured out which side was ground it's the one on the left there. 
and I went ahead and just put an eyelid on there and I'm basically going to do the same thing. We're just going to put the bolt down through on the lid here and it's going to ground itself out and then it should operate fine. I tested it here and it works. So you guys keep your eyes on the solenoid here. We'll ground out this side and then we can touch our hot wire to the positive side of the solenoid and bam, Bob's your auntie. It sucks that thing back in, which should turn on the fuel rack in the pump there. Also, this little arm here that I had pinned back, I don't know exactly what that does. I think that's a governor spring or something. Because this is the throttle over here. And the apparatus that the solenoid engages is down in here. So, from what I can tell, the solenoid was obviously not working because we didn't have it connected and this wasn't doing anything so yeah let's put this thing back together and hopefully we can get some fuel up to our injectors all right so this is our ground eyelet now should be able to just do that right there and bam we should have a ground now. All right, now that we're installed, let's double confirm our solenoid is working. Oh yeah, I can hear it clicking in there just fine. Well, if you got it, flaunt it. I just quick and dirty stripped off these wires right here and rigged this switch back into the mix, so we should have a shutdown switch provided that Everything's working. I can still feel it clicking in there, so should be good. Let's go ahead and give this thing another go, and hopefully we get some fuel up to the injectors this time. All right, our switch is in the run position. Hopefully this is the last time we have to do this. Contact. Oh yeah, baby, we're pushing some fuel now. <laughs> Let's crank it over again. Let's crank it over again. Contact. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I am excited, guys. I love getting things fired up. I don't know what it is about it, but there is no better feeling in the world to me than getting something like this fired up after it's been sitting a long time. Since we've been cranking it over, though, let's go ahead and pull the dipstick, check the oil for the heck of it, and it is sucked down quite a bit. We're just on to the add mark. So, yeah, let's go ahead and dump some oil in there. I'm glad I checked that. That was just a weird thing. I just all of a sudden had a feeling I should check that. Oil is topped back off. We should be good to go. So it looks like we got fuel on all but number one here. So I'm gonna leave number one loose for right now and we are gonna go ahead and tighten the rest of these injector lines up. And then if we can get it to fire, it should start pushing fuel to that number one. And I can tighten it up then. It'll run on five cylinders, no problem. It's probably what Fat Alice runs on normally. All right guys, this should be the moment of truth here. I think we are finally ready to try to actually start this thing. I want you guys to get down in the comments, let me know what you think is going to happen. Is this thing going to fire right up? Is it going to give me some more grief? Is it going to run good? Is it going to run like crap? We don't know. But let's find out. Contact! Two, 
Little teeny whiff of ether. Contact. <laughs> it likes ether. I guess now we know the engine will run, but why isn't it getting enough fuel to run on its own? All right, I've got the throttle pinned to what I believe is wide open. You go ahead and give her again. Contact. That was cool, I didn't even give it any ether. And the second development, we got fuel up to our number one injector now. We got that number one closed up. Let's go ahead and try this again. Still no ether. Is it gonna go? Contact. I feel like it must have had some residual ether to fire up that easy last time. Just a little whiff, wake it up. Contact. Maybe I'm going to full off throttle. Maybe I'm backwards here. Contact. Not idling, but man, this thing sounds awesome. I mean, it's running great. Yes, I am so excited. Did you guys hear how good this thing runs? It runs so smooth compared to Fat Alice. I have to play around and get it adjusted to where it wants to idle because it's uh, the throttle is basically supposed to be electronically controlled, and I'm trying to basically hold it at idle, and it wants to default uh, to like no throttle basically. So this little servo controlled throttle arm you know we don't even have the feed hooked up to it you know something probably from this harness or one of the harnesses is supposed to tie into it and it'll probably self-regulate the apparatus over here this guy i believe tells the engine speed and it's supposed to communicate to all the rest of the systems here through all this gobbledygook of wiring and nonsense through the engine speed controller and all that other crap that is supposed to self-regulate via this guy but we can just basically play around with these screws here and get it to idle wherever we want I do see we have a fuel leak uh, this gasket underneath the lid that we had removed was pretty hard and I put it back together but it's not it doesn't appear to be sealing it looks like it was pushing fuel down over the side here not terrible but we will have to replace that. Not a big deal at all. Shut our solenoid off. Uh, so let me play around with this thing. We'll see if we can't get this thing fired back up and let it run for a while and make sure that we don't have any other issues. I'm sitting there blaming the fuel leak on a leaky gasket and it still could be, but I'm also staring in the face the fitting that I did not tighten up. This is the return line down off the injectors. Whatever fuel doesn't get burnt comes back into the pump this way and eventually back to tank. I had to remove this fitting to take the cover off and, ne and neglected to tighten it up afterwards. So we could be getting fuel coming out of that as well, making it look like that gasket. All right, let's see if we can't get this thing fired back up and make it idle. Switch is on, contact. <laughs>
Hot dang, that thing runs good, huh? Just listen to her purr. Oh, I am excited about this. What do you guys think? $500 well spent, right? Oh yeah, I think so. guys this thing runs cherry what do you guys think $500 well spent I think so and I cannot wait to get some time to yank this thing out of this frame and throw it in an old fat Alice because this thing is 10 times the power plant than we got in there right now I know that for sure it sounds awesome and like I said before, we don't know how long this thing's even been sitting. The fuel system itself, I mean, I've run it probably 15 minutes now. I mean, there's been some cuts. You guys probably haven't seen everything. I've probably run it about 15 minutes, and I don't know that I've even run it enough to really get all the old fuel out of the fuel filters. So the longer we run it, the better I'm sure it's going to run. We'll dump some ATF in there, let those injectors get lubed up good. We still have a fuel leak over here. I can't tell whether it's the gasket up here or the seal that's behind this governor arm. So we will have to look into that. Not a bad fuel leak. We can manage that. We can fix it up. Not a big deal. But man, it runs good. I'm really excited about that. Well, how do you like that? I let this thing probably run about 20 minutes now and it is definitely up to temperature and it is running phenomenally well for sitting as long as it has yep that's hot uh the block is all thoroughly warmed up i would say i don't have any gauges to see if it's you know rated right 180 degrees or whatever but it uh it sure seems like it's up to temperature but basically i'm pretty stoked about this that seems like a solid investment for 500 bucks I am not going to complain one bit about that. I just noticed this tag here for the first time. Alice Chalmers 3500A, manufactured in 10 of 1985. So that's pretty cool. Made in the USA. Boy, that's a tag I like to see. Well guys, I guess that about wraps this one up. I really don't have anything left to show you on this thing. It runs great. There's nothing more to say. I've seen plenty of comments in videos past, people telling me that Fat Alice needs some love and you are 100% right. And this is the kind of love that I wanna give it. We're just gonna give her the whole heart transplant and uh, I think she's gonna be a whole new machine. But I guess that about wraps this one up, guys. If you like this video, do me a big favor, hit that thumbs up button down below the video. It really helps out the channel. It doesn't cost you guys a dime. If you guys would like to help support the channel in a little more direct way, head on over to dieselcreek.com. The link is down in the description. We have the merch store over there. You can pick yourself up a stylish hat, a lovely t-shirt, beer koozie, hoodie, all kind of stuff over there at the merch store. That's dieselcreek.com. The link is down in the description. Aside from that, I want to thank Factor for sponsoring today's video. And of course, most important of all, I want to thank you guys for watching. And I will see you on the next video. 